4th of July has very much to do with the Hebrew month Tammuz, in correlation that is. The word Tammuz in Hebrew means to set on heat, to stir up the evil and within someone's soul. And this same word Tammuz also means the main month of the summer, where the heat of the sun draws the attention of humanity to itself. In this same month on the 17th of Tammuz, Moshe comes down from the mountain with the commandments of God for Yasharael. And he finds Yashara worshiping the golden calf. This would be committing adultery, eating meat sacrificed to demons, all under the sun. In this month, also the Romans came against Jerusalem, burnt the Torah, with, and also placed an idol in the holy temple. In this month, also the walls of Jerusalem were five calamities that affected the Yahudi people. These are one, Moshe broke the tables of stone and two, an idol known as the golden calf was erected in 1313 BC. Three, the daily sacrificial offerings were discontinued in 423 BC. Four, Jerusalem's walls were breached in 69 BC. And five, the Roman military leader Apostolus burned a Torah scroll, possibly around 50 CE, just before the Bar Kokhba revolt. That's my dog. This may have contributed to the Bar Kokhba revolt, actually in self. The last war between the Romans and between 132 and 135 AD. Now this is part two, we're gonna read the amendment, the constitution. This will be actually article one, section two. But first we're gonna find out where we're getting this from. This comes from a website about this bastard who's claiming he's an Indian, but he's not. Let's see if I can bring him up real quick. There he is, there he is, that's the bastard. David Yeagley, great grandson of Comanche leader Bad Eagle, that's a lie. But this guy says, Constitution says Negroes three-fifth human. It's not true. His argument is that it says it represents percentages, uh, scales, graphs, things like that. Let me see what he says specifically. The issue in 1787 was about demographics, population numbers, and political representation in Congress. It had nothing to do with the personal human qualities of any individual Negro or of his race in general. That's a lie. We're going to read what the Constitution says. Article 1, Section 2, Paragraph 3. This is the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States, a transcription. Note, the following text is a transcription of the Constitution as it was inscribed by Jacob, Jacob, chalice on parchment the document on display in the rotunda at the national archives museum items that are hyperlinked have since been amended amended to alter modify or rephrase so they altered modified or rephrase anything in red or superseded superseded synonyms for superseded obsolete old so they've made it old anything they highlighted in red Keep that in mind. This is the whole point why I'm reading this. The authenticated text of the Constitution can be found on the website of the government printing office. So they got it hid in another museum, like all of our artifacts. British Museum, other museums, museums in Cairo. They're hiding all the real depictions of Hebrews. So we're going to read something about the article. I never read the Constitution before. This is my first time. Let's go into it. Article 1, Section 2. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. No person shall be a representative, blah, 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 age of 25. Here we go, something in red that they took out. 
representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within these union according to their respective numbers which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons so who is considered free in 1777 including those bound to service for a term of years indentured servants and excluding Indians of course not taxed three-fifths of all other persons that will be the slaves so it doesn't clearly say slaves are three-fifths but if you know anything about Constitution reading and big words it clearly says representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states of the South but these several states in the South who making multi-million dollars off of these Hebrew slaves have to exclude Indians not taxed and everybody else who is not free are considered three-fifths which means you cannot come to vote with more slaves in your state you know the more numbers is greater and they knew the South had more slaves, so they said, them niggas three-fifths. We're not going to have all them niggas coming up representing men, which we are the men of God. In this holiday special, we begin with the words of Frederick Douglass. Born into slavery around 1818, Douglass became a key leader of the abolitionist movement. On July 5, 1852, in Rochester, New York, he gave one of his most famous speeches, the meaning of July 4th for the Negro. He was addressing the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. This is James Earl Jones reading the historic address during a performance of Howard Zinn's Voices of a People's History of the United States. He was introduced by Howard Zinn. Frederick Douglass, once a slave, became a brilliant and powerful leader of the anti-slavery movement. In 1852, he was asked to speak in celebration of the 4th of July. Fellow citizens, pardon me and allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. 
your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes that would, it, that would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour forth a stream, a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed and the crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for the reading of the Constitution. Gentlemen may inquire. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, uh, I appreciate the leadership shown to bring this document for reading today, but I do want to inquire of uh, the chair and perhaps the, uh, the gentleman who is the author of this effort today, Mr. Goodlatte. The language, as I understand it, that we will be reading today uh, does not include some of the original language of the Constitution of the United States. I don't take it very lightly when my colleague or when others before we begin the reading of our sacred document, are raising questions about uh, what we will specifically be reading, what specifically will be redacted based upon uh, amendments or based upon the recommendations of libraries of Congress. But I also want to be very clear, Mr. Speaker and Mr. Goodlett, I recognize that this is a, a request, that in reading those redacted, uh, this is very emotional for me, it's very emotional for I know a number of members, given the struggle, and I'm not trying to take a shot at the process, and Mr. Goodlett knows me, and he knows the spirit within which I'm approaching this, given the struggle of African Americans, given the struggle of women, given the strugg struggle of others to create a more perfect document, while not perfect, a more perfect document, to hear that those elements of the Constitution that have been redacted by amendment are no less serious no less part of our ongoing struggle to improve the country and to make the country better, and our sense in our struggle in whom we are at the Congress of the United States at this point in American history, and our desire to continue to improve the Constitution, many of us don't want that to be lost upon uh, the reading of our, sacred, of our sacred document. And so with that said, uh, I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding, and I just wanted to uh, indicate that uh, this is done with sincerity. It is not done to take a shot at the idea of reading the Constitution, uh, but certainly when we were informed, for example, that the three-fifths clause would not be mentioned and that other elements of the Constitution which justify why some of us fight for programs in the Congress will not be written in the didactic version, it is of consequence to who we are. Thank you, Mr. I, Speaker. I thank the gentleman for his comments, and I take them very much to heart, as has our leadership, in fact, in recognition of the gentleman's concern, I mentioned